There was a recent customer survey that discovered 71% of the 25 to 34 uh, people want built-in vehicle entertainment experience that's something different than what they get off their cell phone, DTS. And so DTS Auto Stage, HD Radio, uh, and then, of course, the whole story about who is going to get the primary place in the dashboard in the future. And I'm really pleased to have Paul Krieger from the Telos Alliance with us today. And Paul's going to talk to us about this little tiny presentation. And uh, he has invited your questions again uh, as we go through. So, Paul, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, Barry. I, I really would like your questions. Go ahead and interrupt me or, or raise a hand or whatever you got to do, because I really don't have a lot here. Um this is this is really kind of pretty simple stuff and how it affects radio, but but bear with me here. Let me get um. There we go. This is really what the pro, uh, presentation I'm going to do here is about. It's preparing the connected car, and I have got this blocking my view. How do I move? Whoa! How do I move? There we go. It moved. Thank you. Um, presentation is called "Preparing for the Connected Car: A Unified Processing Strategy." Um, and also, uh, I titled the presentation, No, Really, Your Stream is Important. For years and years and years, you've heard us talking about, oh, your stream is really important. You know, this, the admission of the smart speaker. It's time to start taking your stream seriously. No, it it, it really, really is in 2024 important. Uh, this is the New York radio ratings from, I think this was the month of it was like a holiday month but what i'm showing here is this is like i ripped this off of radio ratings online wfan just their stream of course this is the famous wfan odyssey station in new york pulling a 0.9 with its stream um you know i could go on uh, i don't want to guess how much nearly a one share is worth in new york city but i'm going to go out on a limb and say it's worth a whole heck of a lot um, but even Edison Research has been uh, last year said that uh, the total portion of radio listening time that comes from streaming rose uh, to 13% in 2023. That's up from 6% if you go back to like, say, 2015. Um, and I'm going to say that one of the reasons for that recent increase in ratings in New York City and where you might see in a lot of PPM markets radio station streams start to kind of come up and bubble up and be more um, important in the ratings game is due to uh, this DTS auto stage. Uh, this was an inside radio last year, combines broadcast radio and internet metadata. Uh, last year, there were five car manufacturers earlier at some point last year, I think they announced eight. Um, DTS auto stage is free to you as a radio station. Um, the user experience that it's going to offer the driver um, is key. And the best part of it is it puts radio really right at the center stage. Even though this dashboard may not look like radio is at the center stage, it is, and we're going to get into that. Uh, the cars that DTS is in right now, Mercedes, Hyundai, Kia, Genesis, and uh, this was announced, I think last month is when this was announced. It was before CES. Uh, BMW, Ford, and Harley is going to start putting DTS Auto Stage in uh, some of the motorcycles. Uh, but really, the great news is that your radio station still continues to be, you know, your over the air signal still continues to be extremely important. But what DTS Auto Stage is going to offer for the broadcasters, think of it in terms of this. As you you drive out of the station signal, uh, you can it just seamlessly pulls up the station stream, and you don't lose. It syncs it. You don't lose any. Keeps the audio quality. Uh, yeah, you could listen to a radio station stream in your car. I listen to radio station streams um, oftentimes using my cell phone. Bluetooth to my car radio. Um, it's not perfect. It's kind of a kludge using Apple CarPlay and Bluetooth to do that. Um, certainly driving has its disadvantages with with uh, sometimes with a phone in your car. And I don't like messing with a phone in my car, but this would make consuming radio so much easy in easier in terms of um, 
that handoff that I discussed earlier, where it hands off from the FM or HD to the uh, radio station stream. And this is where the stream becomes so important. Once and for all, the stream really is, at this point, becomes as important on these car radios as you're over the air. Um, you'll have real-time data from DTS on how stations are using your station. I'll get to that in a second. As a former program director, um, that's one of the pieces that I found really, really interesting as well. Um, but uh, the, 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 the fact that you're going to be able to get your radio station on different devices in the future, the metadata integration is going to be so much richer. Um, Fred Jacobs, who's a real popular consultant, I've, we've, I used our station, used Jacobs Media as a consultant several times at several places where I worked as a program director. He himself says the new DTS Auto Stage data provides the missing link for how radio plays a starring role in cars. And he goes on to say, I wish I had these analytics when I was a program director. So Fred Jacobs is saying that, um, I agree. I was a program director in Phoenix in 2000. Kind of what DTS reminds me of is a mature, technically brilliant way to do what uh, a system that existed in Phoenix. I was a program director for a couple of years in Phoenix. It was like 1999, 2000. Um, and we subscribed to, we subscribed to Arbitron at the time, of course. We also subscribed to Mobile Track, which was in, I think Mobile Track was in Phoenix. Toronto, and then there was one other large market where mobile track was um, in, and they were providing ratings, currency data to, to whoever would subscribe to it. A lot of car dealerships would subscribe to the mobile track data. Basically, what mobile track was, and I tried to find pictures of technically what mobile track did, um, but what it kind of resembled were, were these metal uh, devices. They weren't metal, had to be plastic lightweight, but they were up. You'd be driving down the 202 uh, freeway in Phoenix and you'd see these little shoebox things pointed at the lanes on the freeway. Those were the transponders that were picking up the IF um, frequencies in the cars as, as they drove by and tallying and sending the data overnight to computers and servers that would mash all this information and come up with real time pretty much ratings information based on in-car listenership on the freeways and major roads in and around Phoenix. And, um, you know, uh, you could do a radio station like we would do an Edge Fest. Edge was the name of our radio station. You could do a major station festival with 10,000 people show up. And on Monday, you'd get the ratings from over the weekend and see, oh, look at our ratings go up over the weekend because we had a bunch of our P1s driving around trying to get to the station festival or listening to us to and from. Um, so it was a real useful system at the time to kind of get an early lead as a program director. Um, ratings is research. Uh, we can sit around and cuss Nielsen and Arbitron, you know, but really it is research and can be, can be a useful um, tool for a program director. This was certainly useful for us in Phoenix. But you, you know, the, the 2020 24 uh, version of this is what you see here. Um, talking to a program director, probably, you know, one of my favorite things about this job is that I get to sometimes talk to program directors that are still doing what I used to do, and some of them are super smart, like the guy that I spoke to who said, Hey, over the weekend, we had 15,000 session starts on auto stage. A program director can tell me how many session starts in, in cars using auto stage in uh, uh, that he had. And that was the Monday or Tuesday after the weekend was finished. I think that is, as a former program director, operations manager, someone who cared for, for research and having as many data points as I possibly could to try to guide what we should do with our programming and our brands, Oh my gosh. And it's free. 80% of radio use is in the car. Most of us probably know that. If you're a halfway decent student of the biz, you probably understand that pretty much what we own is the business. What we've got left, 80%. Um, average quarter hours coming from your coming from the car itself. 
uh, I was talking to a company who we got into talking about this presentation that I've been doing. And he said, we just hired somebody. Somebody just got appointed the dashboard specialist for our group of 50 radio stations. So I rest my case. This is kind of where we are. Uh, this is one of the things that a program director, operations manager, general manager, your sales department is going to be concerned with. How does your station look on the dashboard? And it's free. Where unified audio processing comes into play in this in the presentation is, um, you know, certainly FM audio processing. The goals are different than HD, and HD audio processing is actually quite similar to stream processing. Uh, I live in Austin, Texas. I get to travel the country and help customers with their Omnia products, FM, AM, HD streaming. I love it all. University of Texas here in Austin have two FM radio stations, and then they've got a bunch of specialized HD channels. They do a local Austin, Texas music channel that gets played at the airport. Every time you fly into the uh, Austin Bergstrom Airport, uh, the KUTX HD 2 or 3 channel is playing at the airport kind of cool. Uh, so I get to hear our processing when I go to the Austin airport. Love it. I'm such a nerd. Um, but um, the reason why I'm using KUT and KUTX is they inadvertently have sort of been preparing themselves for this DTS auto stage product. And so have uh, I think a company like Bonneville was a large, is a large investor and, and uh, uh, is a large uh, is, is deeply rooted in the success of DTS auto stage as well. So if you want to see what a go, go to where a Bonneville station, I'm going to tell you that the Bonneville station is going to look great on the connected car. Um, but no, having a deep in-depth knowledge of how KUT and KUTX operate. Um, I asked chat GPT to come up with this image for me. I asked them to draw a picture of a hundred Muppets running a radio station in a studio. And this is kind of what it came up with. I asked it to give me an Axia console because I work for the Telus Alliance. Axia is our console brand. The best it could do is a little Axia. It just says A-X-I-A. -A. But that looks like a Tascam console from the 70s. I don't know. I don't know about you guys. But what I was doing with this picture is just trying to illustrate the point is that a station like KUT and KUTX, they do a lot of specialized programming where they have people from all different walks of life that may not be great radio hosts necessarily or great producers. Um, but uh, they can go in and produce something using the equipment that they give them. And then we have the ability with our software at University of Texas to take whatever those producers give their audio processing chain and save the, uh, the audio is always running on, a, on, on some, their, their special products, their live over the air stuff is always saved and they put it and post it. Um, I'll show you here in a second what the station does, how much content they are repurposing for podcasting. Um, but their strategy was to use Omnia 9. Uh, for their FM, uh, we crafted a sound for their two FMs. They've got an FM all NPR talk. They've got an FM that's all college rock or NPR rock, for lack of a better term. Um, but um, yeah, so they wanted a house sound for their HD channels. So we cra crafted the main FM and then you can copy and paste the presets and then craft an HD preset to make it sound really, you know, uh, to, to massage it a little bit, I guess, to, to make it stay within the AAC codec that Xperia gives us. But uh, once you have that sound of the HD crafted, it's real easy in the Omnia 9 architecture to copy that and then paste it in their HD2 and HD3 so that their uh, whole radio station has a house sound when you come to it and you go from fm to hd1 hd2 it's consistent no point do you feel like you've left the radio station or the product or the brand when you hit its hd2 and its hd3 uh likewise they've got zipstream r2s in their plant um and they've opted for the omnia 9x2 audio processing um, which is the same audio processing algorithm as what you're going to find in the Omnia 9. It's the same processing. It just doesn't have FM clipping and FM stuff that we do as well to make the FM part of it. Uh, and then we have a product called Audio Tools. You can give us your HD preset or your stream preset if you'd like. 
if you're using Omnia 9 or any of our streaming products for that matter or processing products, give us your preset. We can turn it into a preset that will work in Omnia tools, which would allow uh, someone to have the same exact uh, preset anyway on their podcast. So it's for any pre-recorded material that you want to post for somebody to consume later. It doesn't have to be aired first. It can be anything that any original podcast material, KUT, KUTX do a ton of original podcasts. Like when we had that horrible winter storm here in Texas a couple of years ago, people lost power. We lost lives. Um, there was a whole podcast series that was done on that, uh, that uh, crisis that we had here in Texas. And it was just went straight to podcast. Uh, but what they, you know, when I think of Omnia 9 sound house management, kind of just outlining here for you everything that we did. Yeah, the codex may be different. You can have the same preset. Yes, it's going to be slightly different when you go from, say, a station's HD codec, 48 kilobits per second to, let's say, 64 on your stream or, or a lower bit rate, say, on your stream. But the feel, the idea here with, with, a, with a unified processing concept is to kind of give the illusion as best you can that somebody's not leaving your brand. Just to give you an idea of how much stuff the, the, the weekend shows, they might have a Thursday night show. People are constantly posting their content that they do on the air later for, um, for uh, later consumption at KUTX. And you could go with your phone, you can go to a browser. And the interesting thing is, given how many producers I know and see how work at, at, at these two brands at University of Texas, everything that you play on their stream sounds like it comes out of the same spigot. Nothing sounds like somebody, like it came from somewhere else. And it all has the same quality. Um, and uh, that's that just to give you an idea of what we are working on at Omnia Labs to give you guys a, a uh, update to where we are. We've been talking a little bit over the past year of this new audio processor we've got called Forza. Uh, it's a five band audio processor. It's designed for streaming right now. It was designed from the ground up. What's new about this, what's different about this is Every time we've made an audio processor, think of it. I mean, it's always started as you know, a box that sits at a transmitter site. And then we repurpose that code and jam it into something that can work for your stream as a Windows computer or as an appliance that can work for your stream. This was designed from the ground up as a container. Um, and because it's a container, it's going to allow us to, to, to do different things with it apply it in different ways as in hardware or in windows software um, this started as a container and we'll you'll see it quickly develop into uh into more products as we move forward this is the iteration for windows that i'm showing here uh, we designed it to be an excellent sounding audio processor with little effort we've got 10 presets i think it comes with maybe 13 presets um where we've gone with audio processing are two flagship processors that we're known for, the Omni 11 and the Omni 9, uh, may have some preset names in them that are kind of out there. You might be like, what does that preset have to do with anything? But we chose really simple names that are descriptive for the sound of each preset. Uh, if you can't see the screen because it's too small or what, now these, these presets that you see here uh, going top to bottom, natural, bright, clear, smooth, full, forward, slam, punchy. So they're real descriptive words that don't require a processing PhD as we put it to kind of understand what the what the sound goal here is. A couple of things that I want you to see if I could show anything on the screen is in the upper right, there's a there's a, a census meter that is kind of grayed out. Um if you're running a stream anywhere below 48 kilobits per second, turn that on. Census makes an incredible difference on low bitrate material. It even, I had a station that was running transcoded stuff over a network and Census fixes it. I couldn't believe that Census, this was my experience, it's just one man's experience, couldn't believe that it was actually not just fixing and preparing the audio well for the codec itself. It was fixing garbage that had been already damaged done to it up at the network level 
I digress. Anyway, next to that, you'll see what uh, it says BS 1770. That's a European um, style of lemming. And I'm sure I saw David Bialik. I want to say hello to David. David could probably um, talk a lot about um, loudness targeting and limiting. BS 1770 is, is an algorithm that I believe it, it describes the uh, loudness limitations that it's going to try to adhere to to, to keep your stream loudness targeted. Um, if you wanted to turn that on and just set below under final a loudness target, in this case, I believe that you'd see there it's set to minus 16, you're done. You, you've, you've loudness targeted your stream and you can go and have a coffee. It's that simple to set this audio processor up for a change. And I like the loudness targeting ability of it too. And the fact that it does definitely help with low bit rate codecs. I see a couple of... Could you do I sell that picture? Ken, I'll be happy to sell uh, you no, it's free. Um you can can you just go to if you got chat GPT, I pay 20 bucks a month for for to have access to AI. I figure why not? I use it sometimes. Um, but I'll be happy to sell uh, to send it to you. Most staff here refer to KUTX music as AAA adult album alternative. Okay, Cole. It is adult album alternative. Cole's here from KUT, KUTX. Hope you're glad to see that I'm using your station as a as a uh, example of a unified audio processing strategy, Cole. I don't think he even knows. Cole's at University of Texas. I don't think he knows I was, I don't think he knows that he's used as a, as a, uh, oh, here's a beautiful blank screen. I'm gonna talk real quickly about loudness targeting. Um, the benefits are improved sound quality. So codecs themselves perform better at lower loudness levels. Um, so processing really comes into an important piece of this, you know, maintaining a nice listening experience at a lower loudness level requires some different processing strategies. But the benefit is long-term, you can keep somebody listening to a stream a lot longer with less fatigue. Um, properly loudness targeting your your stream uh in other parts of the world it's law our tv's got to deal with the calm act um and i i truly in my heart as a former program director believe that somebody is more likely to, to, to stay tuned to your station when there's fewer artifacts that could drive them away listeners will never tell you Talking about FM for a second, listeners will never tell you why they left. I'll go out on a limb and tell you that some listeners will leave your station and come back when, you know, that annoying sound that the radio makes when that song or your station makes when that song is played, they may leave and come back. It's a subconscious thing. I always compare audio processing to mood lighting of a store or something like that. You know, I think it's part of it's part of the radio station's um, competitive edge or mix, but loudness targeting makes your stream sound better. And if you've spent all this money to create a radio station and brand it and create logos, hire people, have a program director, do research, do marketing, all this money you've spent to do all this, I think you should try to sound good any way you can. FM, HD streaming, all of it. Here's the main takeaway. Take control over your station's appearance on the dashboard. DTS is important. Somebody told me, I was talking to a guy in Florida just yesterday. He was telling me that the new Jeep Wagoneer, um, even if your station's HD is out of sync with your main FM by like two or three seconds, it will magically control the experience for the listeners in the car so that you don't ever hear that. I'm going to take this one step further in a second with your over-the-air FM. I'll get to that. But the main take, the other main takeaway is you can hold listeners longer, farther. Somebody could listen all the way across the country to your radio station. Um, get your streaming stuff together. Some side notes I, got, I want to mention. I've got no white papers to support any of this. This is just Paul going around the country. Some things that I've seen and noticed. These new receivers that are in cars are, are computers. And I know there's been, you know, radio stations over the, I can go to certain markets. I can go to one market in the South. Okay. And everybody's doing over 120% modulation. And some of them are doing HD. And I want to get up close. And I want to tell you that if you're doing that, 
you just turn off your HD carrier. Why waste the electricity? Because you're destroying how your HD behaves on your radio. Literally, you're destroying it. The HD carriers can't take up a blow. I've seen about 120% start and it starts incurring into the HD side sideband. So I don't see any advantage to overmodulating, especially if you're doing HD. Uh, 105% stop. Um, good engineering practices come into this. Uh, I, I really, I mean, Frank Foti, it's, it's one of his cornerstones is talking about GEP, good engineering practices. You really should in 2024, considering just delivering to the radio exactly what it's expecting. Exactly. Don't go too crazy on the loudness. I'm going to talk for a brief moment about an experience. This is a real experience I had in New York. I have I carry this piece of software with me on my laptop. I don't have it here. It's called MPX tool, but it allows me to have precise measurement of modulation, loudness. Went to New York City and measured a station that was 4 dB less loud than we'll call station A. Station B is 4 dB less loud than station A up here, which is just sets the loudness mark in New York City, Manhattan. Flames coming off the Empire State Building. I've been to Peru. I haven't seen stations this loud as what I saw in New York City. But I'm not here to criticize what that station is doing as much as I am just saying that when I got into a, uh, uh, an Uber, the lady had a Kia, which has DTS auto stage in it. And I can measure with my tools the fact that station B or A two different completely experiences in terms of loudness. I can measure it, see it, hear it with my device. In the in the Kia, she was listening to the less loud station and went to the way more loud station. There was no difference whatsoever, except that I could hear a little bit more distortion. But the experience, the idea of what these car radios are doing because it's software is to control the experience of the driver and the passengers in the car. So that nothing really... Um, It'll do loudness. It'll do long-term, you know, if you have the loudness turn on, I'm not talking about when you speed up and slow down on the freeway. This is different. This is to make sure that nothing really juts out and disturbs the driver as they're driving down the road. So the, the software, I'm just saying, is it's managing the experience. This is different than what radios used to do. Because this experience is being managed, I think as broadcasters, we need to back up and start rethinking how we're processing a lot of these radio stations within an inch of their life. Um, try to sound good. Um, avoid the fatigue wars. Um, see, I like the idea of loudness targeting, but what about PDs who insist on making their analog HD and stream processing all sound the same? Okay, so somebody has a question. I like the idea of loudness targeting. Um, but what about program directors who insist on making their analog HD and stream processing all sound the same as an over-processed and clipped? Have them call me. Uh, maybe as a former program director, I can try to talk them into it or out of it. Um, I have a couple things that I, I try to, to, um, to rationally rationalize with the program director, try to find out what they hear or why they want their station or why they think their station should be so loud. When I was in New York, the number one radio station, I wish I could take a vote. How many here thinks the number one radio station in New York is the loudest station in New York? Raise your hands on the call. If you think the loudest radio station in New York is the loudest radio station in New York, raise your hand if you think that's so. Because it's not. WLTW, I measured it. Their loudness in New York City, a real polite 6.7 dB composite loudness. No overmodulation. They're not trying to do anything crazy with the number one radio station in New York. It's a real smart approach, I would say. Real smart. Here in Austin, Texas, Bob FM set the processing on the number one station here. Owner, one of the station, really jackhammer loud. It's, it's like a classic hit station. They play 1,200 songs. It's a we play everything kind of station. It's a station that's built on what I call, as a former program director, nothing but clean, pure time. 
spent listening to the radio station and the owner wanted to jack up the processing program director heard it coming in the next morning and he was like okay i know your omni 11 goes to 11 i'm not going to dispute that can you make it do six or seven can you turn it down can you make it so I just want to, you know, I'm like, what, what, what's your goal? What, how, what do you want your station to sound like? He's like, really? I just want to be the best sounding station in town because I think with that and with our QM, that's all I want to do is just be the best sounding station in town so people will just stay there. I wish people would clone you. <laughs> Radio might sound better in some big markets. I hear some AC stations in big markets that just, I can't believe how loud they are. So the loudness wars didn't end in the 80s. I would say the loudness wars that the comment here is the, the loudness wars didn't really end in the 80s. They got worse in the in the aughts. And here's why. Um, the CD manufacturer, the, the record labels, CD manufacturers, excuse me, the record labels. Um, somebody right about 1998 1999 discovered that if you bought a radio processor like an omnia 6 or an apex 2020 i know some audio processors were used to master big cds i'm not sure which ones but you can um, it started with cds from the red hot chili peppers in the late 90s especially the californication album where the loudness of that cd could be measured at like minus seven minus six loofs and at the time you know my audio processor the station i programmed sounded terrible playing that anything off that cd the loudness wars didn't end in the 80s the loudness wars just got started when brick wall limiting um clipping and stuff like that started coming into play i think in the late 90s when we could do all this in dsp um a lot of producers mastering engineers record labels i heard that clinton i don't know if this is true we hear these stories but i you know some, from one record label friend of mine he said that clive davis who was the chairman of um arista a very very popular record label had so many hits over Whitney Houston was on Arista Records, but he was a huge record label mogul. He would sit there in his office and go from one CD in his changer to another CD in the other player and flip back and forth on his receiver. And he wanted his CD to be louder than the other CD. So the loudness wars only began to erupt in the 90s. I just think it's in terms of radio where I think we've reached the point of diminishing returns where the software on these dashboards is going to determine, is going to have some say in what your radio station sounds like. And if you come at it too much, too hard, it's going to turn you down and you might not sound the way you intend. Well, I guess that's the main takeaway. Was there other questions today as I fool around here and Well, it's funny is that loudness all started back in the old AM days. It sure did. But there's a technical reason for it back then. There's not much yeah. of a technical reason for it these days. When you with a CD, when you've got a noise floor at minus 100, I don't know why you want to make it so loud, but um, it's, it's, it's a thing. It, it just is. It's time spent listening is the issue. It, it, you mentioned that your your software... Uh, shows the number of connections that come up. Does it show how long they've been there? Oh, DTS Auto Stage? Yeah. So that's not my software. So DTS Auto Stage is, is a product of Xperi, the folks that own HD. Um, and that would be a question you would have to ask them. I've I've only seen some reports as a former program director. I was shown how cool this product is. And seeing that it's free, I'm just here to tell you that if, if, if I had a radio station and I just found out about this, I would be on the phone with Xperi after this, after I saw this. So maybe you've got a program director back in your building that's unaware. Um, but the... Uh, but yeah, was there a comment of tune in? My experience with this in a rental car was crap. So um, tune in on a Tesla. Maybe I'm spoiled by my Sirius XM, but my Tesla ride was 1,000. 
So tune in pretty much, I was always under the impression tune that tune in was just an aggregator that all they're doing is taking your raw streaming link and they're not doing anything technical to it, but passing it along. I could be wrong. I know they can insert ads, but um, I'd be curious if uh, I'd like to know more about that myself. Well, as I said, it'd be interesting to see if they can take that data of how many extremes there are and then m massage it to let you know what the uh, the TSL is, because that's a big issue. You're right. It doesn't matter where your modulation peaks are. What matters is your TSL. Mm -hmm. and totally. Totally. So as a, so as a former program director, here's how I, here's how I look at it. Bear with me for just a moment while I grandstand. So I was in Atlanta. We had a $1.4 million morning show. We spent $700,000 a year just marketing the morning show, not the music images of the radio station. This was a giant radio station. You can look at my resume and figure out what station it was probably. Um, but uh, you, you do $50,000 research studies where you, I mean, uh, where, where you ask listeners, you know, what you think of your radio station, you go through all these hoops to try to um, bring people to your radio station, you know we're a free medium and then the program director sets the mood lighting of the radio station to where you can't listen to it where it's just so fatiguing and annoying um as a program director that's that was never my goal my goal as a program director was to never be the loudest station on the dial my goal was to be uh always to leave some in the tank if i had to get louder but i just wanted to sound good i, I I wanted my source material to sound good. And that's why I say presets for audio processors are for markets. It's not for, for formats. Uh, let's see. There was another comment here. Tune in does reprocess some streams. Interesting. That's a good point. When you mentioned that the car uh, radios in many cars are already starting to do this business of, Normalization. Normalization. Kind of what I would call it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that would be the right word. And I think it's important for people to know because there are too many program directors that want to smash the meter and that's all they care about. Uh, when I was in the <clears throat> business of producing audio processors and then setting up stations, every time the guy would tell me to turn the, the bass up higher, I'd turn it down a little bit. And I finally got him to learn that less is more when you want quality. Now, Correct. Telos, Omnia, uh, Frank has the reputation uh, for screaming loud processors. <laughs> well, wait a second. Hang on. I was so you bring up <laughs> you bring up something real interesting here. So I want to grandstand here about something. Uh, that, I think that's a fundamental. If I'm going to defend Frank. Oh, uh, I, I've got to defend him, too, because you didn't let me finish the sentence. Sorry, go ahead. You know, Frank Frank has a reputation to a certain extent from what, what he did in New York, but it's just like uh, Ron Jones did with CRL uh, that could go to 11. The, the fact is that it's the guy in the field who sets these things up and makes such a mess of audio when if you just back down a little bit, you would come up with a really nice sound and you'd make your listeners happy. Just like you were talking about the woman in the, uh, was it a Kia that listened to the softer station rather than the louder one? Well, no, just to go back to that story real quick, I just knew for a fact, because I had my measurement tools, which station was dramatically in another universe louder than the other. And in the DTS auto stage, it was about there. Right? Uh-huh. Right yeah. Oh, difference. okay, okay. I... There was no difference. The software is determining how I've, loud that station is going to be when she flips it on. I've conflated two, two aspects, and I apologize for that. No, it, that's okay. But yes, Frank and, and Corny uh, as well, they have worked really hard at clean audio. And I think that's something that uh, whoever is using whatever processor, uh, if they're looking for a processor, uh, this is one of the ones that, that has to be recommended because you can get a good sound without screaming well, well back to frank for a second and z100 in new york city i never when i i've heard air checks of z100 i never heard it as a wall of sound 
I, that was never my takeaway from it. And I got this job by talking to Frank Foti and talking to him about my processing sensibilities, about a mutual friend of ours that was now deceased. His name was Matt Connor. He's from the New York area. And we talked about how, how, Matt, how, how if you process something within an inch of its life, if you just smash something, if you run it through your smashinator, and that's your processing goal, you're, there's nothing left for the ear to latch onto. It becomes, it's like the, the little, the things that the ear might try to grab onto, the dynamics. I call it, I have a name for it, apparent dynamic range. Station may not have a ton of dynamic range, but there's the appearance or apparent dynamic range and that's the sweet and that is, words can describe audio it's kind of difficult difficult to come up with words but i think that, that's where words like sweetness and things like that that are intangible words come into play in in processing and that's the the finer colors like and acoustics that... well those of us who worked in new york will remember wplj you talk about loud and mashed processing you know that was that was before God took it over. That seems to be um, the New York way of so. From having looked at the market as a whole, um, that market's a little bit all over the place. You know, I'll tell you about some other markets. Denver is is a problem child. Nashville is is an interesting market. Denver is just a super loud to me strident audio processed market. You can go to Nashville and. The overmodulation that I talked about, that's that's totally real. Go look, figure out for yourself. Um, Seattle is the bassiest market, like like bass that's going to shake in the trunk. Hmm. Seattle is the bass. Every radio station's got crazy bass settings. It's just, again, that's where I've learned in this job over six or seven years that presets are really for markets, not formats. They might work from, from one market to another but so many times i've had you know pre oh I'm the no, we're the number one station in this market and here's our preset and they give it to another station in the cluster and the other station and the other markets like what's this garbage this doesn't sound anything like in my market it is it's, and that's that's it what you just said in my market in my market had I've, I've seen that a number of times i haven't had the chance to fly around like you and listen as deeply as you but yeah uh, i've seen stations that will sit on adjust their audio processing, come out with a wonderful signal. And then the GM or the PD comes in and says, but we don't sound like the other guys. Um, Hot 97 got gets a, gets a gold store, uh, star award for me. I think Alex Roman has a nice sounding station in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and light, 106.7. Kelly, see your hand. I was just going to comment that a lot of the, the difference in, in stations primarily on FM that I've noticed is also dependent on the overall structure of their transmission system as well. You know, if they've got um, older transmitters that are out of tune or older exciters or, you know, even antennas with problems, bandwidth of the transmission system actually does make a fairly significant difference in sound. You know, how much AM noise is, is involved so to your point, Paul, when you take a preset and you send it to another station in another town, depending as to how they're put together, it may sound better or worse than another station with that same processor and, and same setting. And everybody's scratching their head saying, why doesn't why? this sound the yeah, same? It's yeah, because well, station eight has a, has a digital STL. Station B's got a composite STL. Could be station A's got clean audio in their automation system. Station B's loading MP3s. There are yeah. a lot of variables, like you said. Well, when I was a PD of WPIX uh, FM, uh, I put a spectrum analyzer on a tuner and found that almost everybody, except us and WLTW, were pretty much just big splotches of green. Big splotches of green in terms of just like how over-deviated they were? or No, they were... Uh, you know, if you take a look at, uh, you know, any digital workstation, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Oh, that, you mean the waveform? You mean the... waveform was mm -hmm. just one big splotch. Mm -hmm. No dynamic range. Um, 
just process to death. And that was basically New York radio. Yeah, it's still mostly like that, although not everyone is like that. Um, well, I guess you get, uh, you know, if you say TSL is what's most important, I'll deviate a little from that with depending on formats. But the um, sorry, the what do you call it? Uh, I just lost my turn of thought. The um, you know when everybody's irritating then you know the uh playing field is very level true in a, in a horrible way um robert leanbergen says many if i mis mispronounce your name i'm sorry he has a comment here many car fm receivers uh the if stage will clip at 115 percent. exactly correct and that's one of the things i'm getting at is that um when you go to a market so i was in peru uh, I went to Peru with one of our sales guys that handles international and got to see what radio looks like in Peru. Um, the good news is they're not running their FM clippers within an inch of their life. No, they're running the modulation uh, at 150%. So an Omnia 9 will do a fancy trick on the D-Mod where the D-Mod goes ridiculous. That's one of the, the, the visual aspects that'll happen physically when you do composite clipping, especially the style that the Omnia 9 does. So I was seeing D-Mod peaks at 200% in Peru while the main composite was peaking, banging at 156, 150%. Now, at pretty much every station in Peru, like what you said, every station was doing it. So it's okay, right? Well, the problem is you, you get into, um, so I was taking Uber's or lifts or whatever around um, Lima to get wherever I had to go. Radio sounded ghastly. Just every, there was no decent sounding radio station. It sounded like a wall of hot garbage coming out of the radio. So when you go over 115%, the computer, it doesn't, there's no more. There's, there's nothing else to get. So so I'm definitely here to tell you that overmodulating is not the way to get anything extra and 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 loudness. Just you know, cranking up your audio processing, trying to to be louder than the other guy. That's that's a point of diminishing returns. Can be. Paul, have you seen very many places? I mean, this was common some years back where they cascade two audio processors. Oh God! So I was asked by somebody. Um, can the Omni 11's eh, wideband AGC be defeated? The answer is yes. Why would you want to do that? Because we want to put an Orban 8500 in front of it. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Stop. Less is more. Please, less is more. David B. Alex says normalization is important when commercials are inserted from multiple sources. Yes. I actually back to normalization. I always tell program directors one of the biggest favors you can do for your audio processing and your STL and everything downstream is to have a normalization strategy upon ingest. So if you can, you know, when you're ingesting commercials, you're ingesting your music, pick a loudness target for your building because that'll make life easier on everything downstream, including the audio, especially the audio processor. Because the audio processor, if you think about it, it's going to get a real good average loudness fed to it. So it's going to be happier. Well, remember uh, Herb Squire's uh, cascading codecs, where there's one codec from the SDL, there's another codec on the, uh, on the computer. So each one is taking bits and pieces out of the signal. Tim says it was just in Houston, really interesting FM band levels. In terms of modulation, Houston is really um, a polite market in terms of modulation. There's nobody over-modulating in Houston. In fact, what I see is in the big markets every, uh, except New York, um, there's you know, Los Angeles is so, everyone is so polite in Los Angeles. Everyone's at 100%. Um, but uh, what I see in Houston is audio processing that tends to be really, really shrill and loud. Houston's a super, Houston's a very strident, annoying market to listen to. That's about the best way I can describe it. 
Come to Austin. I sit processing in probably 11 Omnias. There's a mixture of Omnia 11s and Omnia 9s. And I can tell you there's about 10 or 11 stations in the market that sound really nice. And they got good watermark quality. No Voltaires screaming at you. Well, it's a lot easier today than it used to be to uh, put a pump at 2.7 kilohertz or something like that. But you're right. It, it, it Each market gets its sound. And unfortunately, it's copycat all too often. And so you'll, I, I find it interesting. And, and I'd love for us perhaps another time off, off offline to discuss some of these markets. And uh, I, th I think it's a very interesting topic. Yeah. Um, I love talking about audio processing. I could go all day, but it would get really, really boring for all, most people, like 90%, 95% of the people pretty, pretty quickly. Um, is there any other questions or comments here? Tim was using his Innovonics to watch different stations when he was down down there in texas and the modulation level is 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 complete i won't say completely separate but it it's not the same as the eq of the uh design so um my my mpx tool which is a software that i believe Nautel might be releasing or using as in their transmitters at some point in the future um, but MPX tool was a piece of software that Leif Kleisen created, uh, and it was initially given free with the first Omnia 9s that we sold. Um, and then we stopped giving it away with the software, and it went away. Uh, and then Leif made the software work with SDR. So basically, you've got all the, the spectrum analyzer tools, the RTA analysis, the uh, uh, loudness analysis, short term, long term, whatever you want to look at. It's a Swiss Army knife of measurement. Um, and I can carry that with me and look at uh, stations up and down the band. It's, Lace is just a, it's, a marvelous programmer. Omnia uh, Omni 9 is a brilliant brilliant ecosystem and product everything that he's done from you know all of his nf remote products as we kind of label them as in the company meaning all of his linear acoustic products because he's got a ton of tv products that he made for linear acoustics that use the same nf remote software that um that we use on the radio side to uh, talk to an omnia 9 before omnia took it over he it was a it was a freeware basically uh, that he puts i first saw it in amsterdam and i was just blown away by all the breakaway yeah 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 it's Kelly? called B it's called ba1 now um and it, it's more even more fully featured than it was as as breakaway i used breakaway on an fm translator in tulsa for several years and and used it on a backup we had a whole i had a backup fm chain for kmyz in tulsa we had a 100 kilowatt main omnia six on that but for when we went to our uh, our backup site when we had antenna work being done on our main or whatever, that was breakaway feeding a five kilowatt solid state. And it sounded great. I mean, I, I don't know, no offense to the Omni SX, but <laughs> every time it switched to breakaway, I kind of thought that breakaway had an edge. I hope Frank's not watching. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah. I wanted to get back to uh Voltaire, your comment about Voltaire and, mm -hmm. uh, and some of the excessive processing that that folks do sometimes. Um, I was noticing I, I got my hands on a TVC15. Noticed the uh, David Bowie reference in that device, but um, it was a great device. Um, I, I was able to look at stations, but one of the things that I found were that that um, certain bands of audio energy would cause the encoding to stop um violins were noticeable in that frequency range you'd actually watch the encoding stop with certain voices you'd see the encoding stop um, when was this was this with cbat or ecbat was this pre-voltaire or post-voltaire um i don't know i was looking at via the tvc15 at just stations on the dial just basically tuning across post-voltaire okay. okay looking at what they were doing yeah so it'd I be see. technically post Voltaire. But what was interesting to me was, and I don't know whether this is a Nielsen issue, I'd assume it is, that when certain frequencies come across or, or band ranges, it seems like the encoding pauses 
for a certain amount of time. And I was wondering if, you know, when you guys have been looking at this stuff over time between, you know, your Voltaire and, and how they handle um, the Nielsen encoding along with audio processing and how it works together. Have you seen any instances where stations that do excessive processing or doing, you know, excessive processing to get 125% uh, percent peaks um, are also affecting the quality of the PPM data going down the line? Um, and why you guys stop producing the TBC15, which I just think is an awesome device. Let me take that question first. Let me take your last question first. Why did we stop making the TBC15? Because broadcasters, I think, got fatigued by Voltaire. Um, most broadcasters don't know what to do with a Voltaire. Most broadcasters don't follow good engineering practice with Voltaire. Most broadcasters are D students. Fair enough. No, I, I think that's I think that's accurate. I think that I think that a lot of I think that a lot of engineers in some cases have been told to turn the thing up to eleven. Yes. So it's a programming thing. So yeah. So it becomes a machismo um, competitive thing. There's so there's it's a multi layered answer. You you asked a lot. You you've made a lot of good points. So I I, I want to take the why did we stop making the TVC one five? We stopped making it because there was a lack of interest. It didn't. It wasn't a big seller, but it was. In, but as you point out, it was incredibly useful. So let's let's go back. I'm just going to be real free and frank here. Um, we created Voltaire at the behest of the broadcast industry because broadcasters saw there was a problem. So we addressed it for broadcasters. Nielsen caught wind. They found out what was going on. They didn't really care for it too much. Sued us. Wanted to sue us out of existence. Come to find out radio stations have been doing things with their air chain and they're going to continue to be able to do state things with their air chain, whatever. Whatever you do as a radio station, you're allowed to do uh, with your air chain. That was kind of where things were left with Nielsen. Um, um When Voltaire first came out, there was a real need, and it uncovered a weakness in the encoding scheme. Nielsen did, I think, what they did the best to quickly fix it and address it and make it better, and that was to reissue their encoder set, um, update the EPROMs in your encoders, if you did, if you remember updating from CBET to ECBET. As I understand it from my layman's perspective that increases the watermark level it was way down at minus 60 perhaps before under cbat and it's at minus 40 now so your station is going to have a better shot at watermarking in a ppm market right off the bat by the fact that the watermark isn't way down at minus 60 because i i didn't realize it was and i could be wrong my facts and figures could be off this is what i was told 30 i don't know if this is true um, I may not, I don't know, may not know what I'm talking about here. I'm in over my head a little bit, um, but that's, that was all my understanding. So back to Voltaire. Um, it's, I do believe though, just to, just to start over again, I think it's the most misapplied, misunderstood box that's ever been handed to a radio station engineer, general manager, or program director. Um, I just do because, the, because of what I hear around the country. Um, the manual says run it between six and 10. And uh, interesting footnote, if you have a Voltaire, if I'm boring too many of you, I apologize. The original Voltaire went to 42. And the one, in, I think it stops at 23 or 24 is where the one that went to market stops. But um, really, if, if watermarking is to be done well, you, you're, I call it the efficiency of your watermark. You shouldn't hear your watermark. You shouldn't hear any, if, any, any, any efforts to enhance it. You shouldn't. If a couple of things are being done, one, you're using either insert points that we've created in the Omni 11, Omni Vault. I know our competitors have them too, built into the processor, a side chain for your ratings watermark device. Highly recommend using one of those first. 
instead of using compellers everywhere or some other, you know, a gain staging device to stick in front of your watermark unit. Stop. The, the, the insert points and the patch points are in our processors for a reason. It's a really good idea to gain a better consistency, efficiency of your watermark first. I could see that with the TVC, even without a Voltaire. Clean audio comes up, back to what I was saying earlier about clean audio. Death to MP3s, get rid of the MP3s. Watermark is a mono game. Your L minus R quality matters very much. So if I was a program director, I would make sure that everything on my radio station that I did content wise had some degree of music underneath it, if it was at all possible. Something to keep the watermark from, 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 a, from an organic perspective, from a programming perspective, to keep the encoder busy. Um, I think that's part of it, uh, is also programming strategy. I think good programming strategies can sometimes help uh, with, with watermarking as well. Um, but stopping the Voltaire madness at about 10 is would, would be my other suggestion. Well, that's a problem for talk. No music under talk. Uh, that's not true. So you go to New York City, WFA, uh, the sport, the, what was this? The, it was a teletype for decades on WKC. On, was it WCS? INS. I, INS, sorry. Um, actually, believe it or not, a teletype would work really well in 2024 with a Voltaire because the teletype is just enough audio, especially in the mid range, to keep the watermark up there. Teletype would be great as background noise on the talk station. It may sound weird or dated to do in 2024. I would think though, from a programming content perspective, I might not want that noise there because what is the tele? What, what, what noise is that? What does that mean? Um, but from a sound, strictly sound-based perspective, I think that would help the watermark register. I do. Well, I doubt we would ever have used it on WOR. <laughs> well, what if you took a uh, low-frequency tone and just put underneath the microphone just something that would generally be outside the realm of normal hearing would that keep the watermark going I, I, I can't speak for that the goal with watermarking is oh, it's all between one and three kilohertz is my understanding so anything low frequency is not gonna yeah not to gonna do, do anything for yeah uh, Paul. Um, but 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 real, real quick, some voices encode better than others, and I can't speak to that. That's just the nature of of watermarking. Um, I'll, you'll see some voices. Um, I thought for a correlation, there seemed to be a correlation sometimes of how the watermark quality would appear based on how close mic'd the talent was, and I'm not quite sure that I, I don't I don't think that's the case. It, it it's it's um, some voices just encode better than others. Paul, uh, we've we've gone past an hour here, and we're I'm amazed. Uh, virtually everybody has stayed. You you are enthralled oh. to listen to, and Thank I'm you. not chasing you away. I just want to give you a chance. If you have a card to throw up with uh, your contact information, uh, it's up it's up on the screen right now. And one thing I want to offer before no, I go, it's, it's not. We've we've gone oh. back to seeing one another, but oh, go sorry. ahead, pop it back up. So I wanted to offer anybody, if you can send me a direct link to your station stream, I can tell you what your loudness target is, uh, what, what, about where your loudness is of your stream, you know, uh, over a period of certain amount of time. Just let me know. Uh, you can email it to me. My email address is down there below. Um, I can get you a demo of anything you'd like to try, software or hardware. I'm always here for our friends in radio. Well, we certainly appreciate it. And um you know, have you back again one of these days talk about our aspect of this. I think the next person you'll be hearing from is hopefully Frank before NAB. I know we're we're running up to NAB furiously, feverishly working on a bunch of different stuff. So it's gonna yeah. be fun. I'd like to I'd like to book a date for Frank that's your convenience while we have openings and uh tell I will me, set I will set that up with him. Yeah, tell me what works there. But we're not chasing I'm not chasing you away or anything. I'm just I want to get that that card up for those that, that do have to uh, head out for some reason. But if, if you're uh, willing to take some more questions, uh, that that's great too. Yeah. If you have a question for Paul, press your sta space bar, uh, alternate A, raise your hand. Uh, let us know you're out there somewhere. Set off a firecracker.
Wow. I I just I just killed the flow, didn't I? Hey Paul, Brian Walker with BSW here. Hey Brian. Um installed a uh, processor yesterday down in the uh, Portland, Oregon market and we set it up for 99% modulation. And you're absolutely right. All of these problems that the station was having in their HD went away. So amazing, uh, huh? Well, that, so <laughs> I've, I've helped customers. I had one customer. This is a true story. Tales from the road. Customer calls me saying, these 80 songs we're playing, we keep getting dropouts in the Omni 9 in the same place in the song every time. I'm like, what on earth are you people doing to our processor? <laughs> I mean, so a customer right here, I mean, not to be smarty, smarty pants about it, but it's like, okay, at that point, it's like, what are you doing? And yeah. and I, I ran them through things like, check your cable, AES cable, make sure that's, but the, I'm still thinking that doesn't, and I'm like, wait a second. What's your, uh, so they, um, they had a Gates, the new Gates 4, E H D exporter, I do believe. Anything digital has an absolute limit where it doesn't go anymore. And so does their box, as it should. It's at some point the so the feature, as I understand it, for this Gates Exciter is uh, this HD um exciter combo, is it um you're able to feed it the HD, you're able to feed it the FM and it will take the HD and match it to the FM level. That's that's my understanding. It keeps the timing. It's designed to, to do all that. So what was the station doing wrong? Um, they were sending the HD levels into the red on the exporter, even though the device itself is able to set the loudness between your FM main and your HD. The program director still thinks that, you know, everything going into the red is, you know, that's how that happened. But every time, but as soon as they back the levels down, oh, it wasn't the Omni 9 at all. <laughs> um, but uh, that's one thing that I would, I would suggest is, uh, you know, if you're having problems with your HD, make sure that your HD1, HD2, make sure that your levels are um, reasonable, under control, so that you're not hitting the hitting the codex it'll also improve the metallic sound of the streams people do have volume knobs <laughs>